Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. The summary was produced by the Good Book Company. The Childhood. While for many American children, childhood is devoid of worry and security and filled with games and parental love, David Goggins' life was not exactly following the same pattern. He was born in 1975 in New York, and starting at the age of six, Goggins became a slave of his father. Self made businessman Trunus, his father, owned a roller disco rink, and his family was his workforce. Almost every evening, he made David Goggins, with his brother and mother, work hard at the ice rink until midnight. Between six and eight years old, David had to take care of the skating shoes. Their mother would prepare a warm meal in the ice rink office. Late night, after the work at the ice rink was completed, the children could rest. Unfortunately, it was almost difficult to sleep because of the thumping music on the dance floor. The next days, when they had to go to school, David was tired and often fell asleep during the courses. While this routine would be intolerable to any child, his father's brutality made David's life, his brother, and his mother's quite impossible. David had often witnessed the cruel beatings his father had administered with a belt to his mother when she disobeyed him. When David had a severe ear infection and she took him to a hospital, Trumas beat her senseless because he hated to spend money on his family, even if it was a matter of health. Whenever he spoke in defending his mother, David felt the cruelty of his father on his skin too. Fortunately, at eight years old, David and his mother managed to escape the tyrant. She convinced Trunas to make a credit card in her name, and with the help of a neighbor, she planned their escape to a town in Indiana. Unfortunately, David's older brother remained with his father, despite his cruelty. Thus, David had very rare opportunities to see his brother again. Indiana David escaped from his abusive father, but that didn't mean that the rest of his childhood and adolescence were easy. In small-town Indiana, where David spent his formative years, he had to endure poverty and was constantly followed by the traumas of his childhood. Poverty was also pressing them both, due to the fact that his father did not lift a finger to help his own child and his wife in the new life they have started. They lived in a public housing block where they struggled to survive on his mother's part-time job check and $123 monthly welfare. Because of the trauma experienced with his violent father, starting with the third grade, David developed a nervous stutter. His hair began to fall out, and his skin lost its pigment, thus turning a different color. Later, as an adult, he realized that in his childhood, he suffered from the so-called toxic stress. This phenomenon is present in young children who have suffered severe abuse. The chemistry of their brain changes, putting them in a permanent state of fight or flight. Thus, David's traumas and abuse resulted in a permanent high alert for dangerous situations. He soon found out that even the most gifted child will have very poor learning outcomes in school because the child will hardly remember the things he had learned in school before. This is a side effect of the toxic stress condition. This meant that David was considered stupid by some of his teachers. David risked being expelled and placed in a school for children with special needs. However, he managed to remain in the school by cheating on his homework and on important standardized tests. The teachers allowed David to stay in school, but with a high price. His education suffered very much to the point that in his teenage years, David even struggled to read. United States Air Forces As a teenager, David's school performance was still limited, struggling with literacy and school. He finally found something to do with his life. He wanted to join the United States Air Force. So he found the motivation to learn how to read, and he was accepted into the Air Force training. But the journey from here was not a smooth one either. David wished to become pararescue, a special type of soldier who is specialized in parachuting into war zones and saves wounded pilots. But in order to achieve his dream, David had yet to pass a very difficult challenge, swimming. His mother had not been able to pay for his swimming lessons. Paralyzed by fear due to the challenges of swimming lessons, David walked away from the military on medical grounds when he was found with a predisposition to sickle cell anemia. Despite the fact that he knew he should have stayed and fought his fear of swimming, he left the Air Force. In 1999, David was 24 years old, and he had a job that did not motivate him at all. Without any hopes of ever joining the United States Air Force, David took refuge in the only pleasure he had, food. 
After leaving the Air Force, David had taken a lot of weight. Eating without any control, he had reached a weight of almost 300 pounds, up from 255. Once he finished his night shifts as a pest exterminator, he headed towards his first breakfast, consisting of a box of donuts and a chocolate milkshake. That was shortly after followed by his mother's breakfast, involving eight cinnamon rolls, ten bacon rashers, six eggs, and huge amounts of cereal. David realized the bitter reality. He was not educated, he had no skills, and his future was a dead end. He used food to cope with this fact, but the motivation to turn his life around was closer than ever. Something was going to change his life forever. Navy SEAL One morning, when he had a hearty breakfast, he saw on television a documentary about Navy SEALs, which is considered the greatest fighting force in the world, but with the hardest training. Watching that documentary, with recruits struggling through the mud, sweat, and tears, David wanted to join them more than anything, especially being impressed by the strength of their character. Here, he found his purpose in life and reason for living and spent the next few weeks calling the U.S. Navy recruiting offices. He put all his convincing power into action to convince everyone that he can successfully train like a SEAL. Luckily, they informed him that there was a program for former military recruits who wanted to join the Navy. However, following this program was not easy. First of all, the program would be closed in three months, and Goggins was too overweight to join the Navy. The maximum allowed weight was 191 pounds and he weighed 297 pounds. That meant that in three months, he had to lose 100 pounds so he could at least hope to enter the SEALs. Goggins began working on the rough side of what he had to do first, to lose weight. Thus, he switched to a rough fitness program. Every morning, he woke up at 4.30 and spent two hours cycling on his bike. Afterward, he went to the nearest swimming pool and swam for two hours. Then he went to the gym for intense training that included circuit training and at least five sets of 200 reps for all major muscle groups. After the gym, he returned to his bike for a few more hours. Once dinner was over, he also spent two hours on the training bike. When the day of enrollment came, Goggins joined the program in great and fit shape. His workout there was tough, and it also included going five and a half days with minimum sleep and tough exercises. However, Goggins pushed through all of it, and he achieved his dream. He joined the Navy. New Challenges As a Navy, Goggins saw his dream come true, but a new routine set in, sending him hungry for new experiences. He wanted to test the limits of his physical capabilities, capabilities that he tested and pushed to the limits when he joined the Navy SEALs. And the answer to his search did not delay to appear. In 2005, he decided that ultra-running, or extreme long-distance running, would be a great challenge for him. Goggins began ultra-running to contribute to a noble cause. When many of his SEAL's Navy colleagues were killed in Afghanistan, Goggins raised money to help the families they left behind. The race he chose was the most challenging in the world, with elevations and impossible heat. Badwater 135, considered to be the ultra-marathon to end all ultra-marathons, begins below sea level in California's Death Valley and finishes at 8,374 feet. Badwater 135 always takes place in July, when Death Valley is the hottest place on the planet. Top runners are able to compete the ultramarathon in less than 48 hours. Before competing in the Badwater Race 135, race organizers called for a mandatory qualifying condition to compete in the Badwater Race. This was about competing in another 100-mile one-day race in the heart of the city, Amazingly, he was successful without special training. Although, he greatly suffered along the route because of sheer exertion. He completed another mile just to ensure that he did finish the race. He only took 19 hours to finish. After this victory, Groggins was accepted as a competitor at 2006 Badwater 135. This time, he trained very hard, studying the terrain and training in extreme heat. When race day came... All the preparation was fruitful as he finished the Badwater 135 race in just 30 hours, finishing in fifth place. Goggins' Success With a lot of hard work, anyone can achieve Goggins' success, and his first advice is work ethic. It is very sad that today our society is heavily dependent on quick fixes. Goggins is convinced that if anyone wants to master themselves and tap into their full potential, there is no quick fix. There is only hard work that will lead to true success. There can be plenty of talent and passion, 
but without ethics and discipline, people will not be able to achieve their dream, just as though they're a bird without wings, unable to ever fly. Goggin's willingness to work hard was the crucial factor that led to all his achievements. Everything else in his life came in second place. Hard work was his highest priority, whether he was in the gym or a SEAL. Many of the people he discussed with said that the time is not enough. They have to spend many hours at the office and with their family, so they don't have time to work hard on other activities. Goggin's opinion is that all these people need to have a great start to the day. He's convinced that he has so many achievements because he always woke up early to do them. And in order to have the same success, everyone also needs to be early birds. A regular day for him starts at 4 a.m. He gets up and runs 6 to 10 miles. He returns back home around 5.15 a.m., which gives him plenty of time to take a shower and have his breakfast. Next, Goggins goes to work by bike. He arrives at his job by 7.30 a.m. after cycling 25 miles. Moreover, he uses his lunch break for a quick gym session or another six miles of running. When he finishes work, he cycles back home, and by 7 p.m., he had enough time that day to cycle 50 miles in total, run at least 10 more miles, and have a 9-to-5 desk job. Final Thoughts David Goggins overcame a violent childhood with many traumas that have affected his health, childhood, and adolescence. He struggled with toxic stress, affecting his ability to learn in school. His dream was to join the Army, and after losing lots of weight in record time, he became a super fit SEAL and an ultra-marathon runner. You have listened to the summary of Can't Hurt Me, produced by The Good Book Company.